But really, more emphasis needs to be given to the development of the responsibility of a man. Because all of the studies show that if the male is stable, emotionally stable, all things else being equal, the woman will draw her stability from him. Now, if it's the other way around, if the female is stable and the male is unstable, you have less of a chance, at least statistically, of predicting a good marriage than if the husband is stable and the wife is unstable. Of course, it's nice if they're both stable, you understand. <laughs> but women are more amenable to drawing from a man in terms of psychological stability than the other way around. But if you look at the creation record, that makes sense. So really, and I hate to say this as a male, but in reality, more responsibility devolves on the male than on the female. Now it's important that you women recognize this because usually you are the ones that are most alert to any deterioration in the relationship. Men are much more obtuse when it comes to spotting difficulties in the marriage than women are. Women are more sensitive to this kind of thing because they are looking to a male to draw their stability and I think that their emotional antennas are a little sharper, a little more elevated than are the males. So the first point about a male is that God designed that he should be the basic stabilizing factor in the relationship. God, you see, made them both incomplete perfect but incomplete and they would need each other by the way he sets this up now a second feature about man other than being the primary source of stabilizing emotional stability and so forth is that man was designed by God to be also more aggressive to be more aggressive to take more initiative and you see this even in the sexual response. By and large, the male is more erotic than a female. Now, that isn't to say that a female cannot be. In fact, she can be a lot more erotic than a male. Now, this, again, is hard for me as a male to admit, but these are the facts. Women basically have a much deeper and greater potential for sexual response than a man does. You know, men think they invented sex. Uh, you know, that they write all the books and tell women what's wrong with them. But really, the female is capable of much deeper and broader sexual response than a male is. But it must be first be brought out. And when uh, I've done a lot of marriage counseling over the years, and uh, I always warn a husband, now look, if your wife is very, very cold and you learn to love her in the way that you should, I mean, Techniques are easy to teach, but to get him to love and adore her, to bring this out. But when it's brought out, I usually counsel them, now you better keep yourself in good health because you might have a rough time keeping up with your wife. <laughs> and I've seen this happen. Many women seem rather inert and cold sexually because they have never really received the kind of love and adoration that is necessary to bring them out. But when they are brought out, it can be very warm and very responsive. And as I say, even in terms of the sexual response, they're capable of much deeper expressions than a man is. But the man basically is the initiator of this. And you see, we must keep in mind now that it is important that a man learn to understand that he is to bring this out in a woman. Many times you see marriage grow very sour and the feelings get very flat because traditionally men find it very easy to take their wives for granted. They cease to manifest the expressions that won her in the first place. And there is a psychological law, never really heard it expressed before this way, and so I'm going to call it Nisa's law, <laughs> that you're going to feel as you consistently think and behave. Now, if a man then stops initiating and expressing himself toward 
the woman, his feelings will grow dull, just as his behavior has grown dull. And then he loses his feelings for his wife, and then somewhere in the course of his activity, he comes across another female who seems to be very attentive, gives him a little bit of ego food, and then he starts expressing himself to her. And then the feelings revive, and he thinks, aha, I'm in love with someone else, you see, which is really a, a very deceptive type of emotional experience that men go through. Some women go through it too, but men are more prone to this. And then he starts becoming aggressive again. And this is what really brings out the male feelings, the aggressiveness that he has. Now, I don't refer to aggressiveness in an animal sense. I'm not using it in that sense. But in the sense of initiation, in the sense of of taking the lead. And then when he finds someone else that he can initiate activity toward and, and manifest special responses, then he becomes alive as a male again. And of course, not really understanding that he could learn just as well to have an affair with his wife, his own wife, you know, that would be perfectly appropriate <laughs> to have an affair with your own wife. But you see, you must understand this, this basic aggressiveness of the male. And of course, this is what's going to give him his sense of masculinity. And when a man really no longer has to work for a woman, he loses some of his maleness in reality. You remember these breakfast cereals that they used to describe as you put milk on them and they snap, crackle, and pop? Well, a male that doesn't have to work for a female is like one of these breakfast cereals that no longer snap, crackles, and pops. He just lies there and absorbs milk. <laughs> it's very mushy, it's soggy, blah. So the second characteristic that God designed to serve the purposes of love, of course, is that man should be the initiator, the aggressor. A third characteristic of the male is that he should provide leadership. That is, once he has initiated, he should watch out after his mate. Now, if you think of the Garden of Eden experience, it wasn't that Eve was going to be attacked by boogeymen. They were not lurking in the garden, the sinister forces. Except, of course, surrounding the tree of life was this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they were to eat together. They were to stick together at this critical issue of these decision-making processes that they had to make these decisions every day, eat of this tree but not of the other. And, of course, in showing their loyalty to God, they were to stick together in this central choice. But woman was not to wander away from man. Man was to provide a sense of continuing firmness, of continuing leadership. And Ellen White speaks about the firmness of the male. You'll see this expression many, many times in various forms. The firmness, the sternness of the male. This continuing leadership. Now, this was not designed to make the woman unequal. But these basic characteristics were designed to polarize the attention of the man for the woman and to make this woman more important to him, to give him a sense of his own identity, his own maleness, that he should have this person to care for, to bring himself out. That could never be brought out by an animal. That could never even be brought out by God. In the presence of God, man discovered that he was perfect but still incomplete. And so we have these three characteristics that we should keep in mind to identify the essential male characteristics. The stability, the aggressiveness, and the leadership characteristics. Now, what about the woman? What are some of her distinctive marks of identification as she left the hand of God? If you look at the record and you read between the lines and you get the flavor of what took place, 
you find, first of all, that a woman has a capacity more than man for dependency. Dependency. Now, this is not a slavish kind of a thing. This does not mean that a woman cannot open the door for herself. They're very capable of doing that kind of thing. But there's a psychological dependency of having a man care for them and attend to them. I've had women tell me who were starved for the affection that they have been deprived of, that they even want to be touched. And it seems like their own completeness is in jeopardy when they lack not the curiosity of a fly going over their bodies, but to have someone give a touch of saying, I know you're there. I can feel you. I appreciate you. I care for you. With my body, I thee worship. I see worth in you. And these physical affections, I think, are very important. Not just something that exists in the bedroom, but I mean the very sacredness of a touch during the day. And I will tell to men many times, I said, look, what you do to your wife at 10 o'clock in the morning is just every bit as important as what you do to her at 10 o'clock at night in bed. Because a woman is very dependent upon this, this kind of attention. Without it, there's a certain incompleteness. And so, first of all, there is a dependency, not to make her a slave, not to lose her identity, but to draw her toward the male. God designed that they should be one. What's going to make them one? If they don't need each other, how can you develop this oneness? It just becomes a trivial matter whether they just happen to get together. But God made them such that they needed each other. And one of the essential characteristics of a female is this dependency. But secondly, a woman has a greater capacity than a man, although men can learn this from women. And by the way, women also learn from men. They complete each other, and this should even begin in the home relationships when they're little kids. But innately, a woman has a deeper capacity for loyalty. And that's the second identifying mark of Females, And it's interesting to observe that even in distorted sexual relationships among women, where uh, you have homosexuality among women, lesbians, that their relationships with each other, even in this distorted fashion, become more stable within the context of their relationship than, say, among male homosexuals. Even in homosexual patterns, females tend to be more loyal in their homosexual patterns than do males. Males traditionally always have been more promiscuous than females. And even when the relationships get distorted, even in the distortions, females tend to be more loyal. And of course, this can be very important to a man because that sense of loyalty, again, something that he does not have innately, but something that is learned and experienced from relating to a woman, and without which he is incomplete, basically comes from his contact with women. Women are basically more loyal. There is a third factor that identifies the characteristics of women as they left the hand of God, is that they're softer. Not just physically, although I think a case can be made for that too, Women are maybe softer. In many respects, they're a lot tougher than men. They bear pain a lot better. The best way to cure the population explosion is let the men carry the children to deliver them. Men are essentially chicken when it comes to things like that. It's just hard enough being a father. If you had to be a mother and go through all of this process. I, I sometimes in developing communication patterns, I'll, I'll uh, ask them to... I'll say to the man, now, by next week that you come in, I want you to explain to me, in a very personal way, what a woman goes through when she has her menstrual period. Or if you men understand this. Well, how am I going to know? You've got to communicate with your wife. She'll tell you, if you listen to her. And I've seen great big men almost paralyzed when they have to really tune in and feel with their wives as to what they go through. And I says, I want you to pick up all of the moods, too. Not just a lot of the physical problems that go with it, but the moods and the emotions that a woman goes through. Men, uh, men find it very difficult to 
to get into this softness. They must learn it from a woman. Even in child rearing, even in, in dealing with children, the, you can see this, this softness. And by the way, throughout the book Adventist Home, you, you'll find also that w where Mrs. White is referring to the firmness of men, she also speaks about the tenderness, the softness of a woman. You'll see that expression in various ways. And I don't think it's just an accident. I think that these are characteristics of women that need to be delineated and clarified so that people can understand the kinds of roles that they should really be taking. So that we don't get these roles indistinguishable because of distortions in the culture. But this softness, a man learns from his identification with a woman. I remember one man was finding it very, very difficult to appreciate the the experiences of his wife. He thought taking care of the children was no problem at all. He couldn't understand why his wife, who wasn't working, she had two young live wires, two little boys, that just were onto, into, around, and on top of, and underneath everything that existed. And when he'd come home, you know, his wife was rather frazzled. And, and he says, be tough about it. You know, he doesn't understand the, the softness and what this does to a woman. So I suggested one time, I, I have an interesting assignment for you. Uh, she looked pretty tired this time that I saw the two of them together. And I knew that she had uh, some relatives that lived oh, somewhere between Oxnard and Ventura. And they had a very nice ranch up there. It was during the summer. And I said, you look like you need a rest, I said to her. I said, I want your husband to take you up this Friday to your relatives in this ranch and, and I want you just to relax for the whole weekend and lie around the swimming pool and uh, the relatives are very happy to wait on her why don't you just take it easy and you I want to babysit <laughs> because I sensed that he his mind was beginning to compute and he was thinking now let's see who shall I turn these house apes over to for the weekend I said oh no no you you take care of them yourself and furthermore, I want the house to be in very decent condition when your wife gets back. <laughs> and I want you to do it all yourself, just like your wife does. Ah, no problem. He quivered a little bit about taking care of the kids, but no problem. I remember mean, that two little boys. They're about six and eight. Now I think as Providence would have it, in this particular situation, this is one of these things where all things work together for good, you know, for those who are wanting to learn this love relationship, as Providence would have it, one of the little boys got diarrhea this week. <laughs> and this man was pulverized. <laughs> And I remember I had an emergency call from him Saturday afternoon. He says, can I quit now? <laughs> Help. <laughs> can I go get my wife? <laughs> no, you got to stick it out. And by Sunday afternoon, when he was ready to go up and get his wife, he was a new man. Now, when his wife got back home, the house was a mess. I mean, it was horrible because, of, of course, as a man will do, you know, I mean, he uh, gets gung-ho about one thing, and he, of course he realized, you know, if he let things go, his wife would straighten it out. But he really did a very poor job. He had a rough time attending to the needs of these boys. The house was uh, chaos. But his wife was very happy to get back to a very messy situation because she had a husband who understood her as never before. And I remember this man said, he says, I will never again criticize my wife for all of her complaints about taking care of the kids in the house. Now I appreciate how she feels. You see, now we have a man who's a little softer. Not this, me Tarzan, you Jane, you know, me tough. <laughs> he learned a little bit of softness. And to learn to feel with a woman, to learn to appreciate her moods and nuances is something that, that men should learn when they're little boys. This should come really in the basic home relationships. Now, why did God do this? Not that they were unequal, not at all. In fact, 
Paul is very specific in the New Testament. He says, in Christ there is no male nor female. I mean, in terms of their worthiness, in terms of their equality, in terms of their status with God. I mean, any kind of equality is never marked by God. They had different roles, but they brought to the relationship aspects that the other person didn't have, and as they shared, they became complete. That's the sense in which they become one. They arrive at a totality of their being by entering into companionship. And God designed it this way so that love would become a necessity. If man wants to receive something from a woman, he has to give. There must be a mutual interaction of giving and receiving. And even in the sexual responses, an old saying that says a man will give love in order to get sex, whereas a woman will give sex in order to get love. I don't know that that's the nicest way of putting it, but there is some significance to this idea that they each have to give something to the other person that the other person wants if they're going to be complete. And God designed it this way so that love would become a necessity. Every human being re reaches out and must have this kind of identity, this kind of oneness, this kind of closeness. And where this does not exist, people break down. They lose their security. They sense their own emptiness, and they lose their own identity. So I think this was providentially designed so that man, being the representative of God, had woven into every fiber of his being this necessity to love. Now, I'd like to derive three lessons from these different roles, these different identities, that I think is very important. First of all, it is important for a realization of our own fulfillment that we take the role designed by God. Looking at it from a man's standpoint, the investment that a man makes in a woman, the stability that he brings to her, the initiativeness, the leadership, the very fact that there is a woman who requires this and who needs this and who wants this is what enhances a man's masculinity. There's nothing worse than not being needed. Now our culture has twisted this because many men think, at least as they're young, they think in terms of, of muscles and physical prowess. And it becomes a shock to a male to discover that that a woman is interested in something more than just a body that lots of muscles. This is very, very difficult for a male to learn in our culture. I can think of my own experience of how difficult it was for me uh, to learn this. You know, I thought that toughness was simply some physical dimension and, and my male identity was in terms of, of uh, physical qualities. And I thought that, uh, you know, I went through a episode of weightlifting. It really didn't increase my, my relationship with women at all. In fact, I think it kind of deteriorated because I spent more time groaning and grunting with all of these weights than I did developing my personality. It's very embarrassing to discover that all of this work you put into uh, this kind of an enterprise uh, maybe makes you admired by the fellows, but uh, uh, girls sometimes find it very gross. I remember uh, one stage in my life when I had worked pretty hard on these muscles. I never became a Charles Atlas. I was too lazy for that. But I did work on it. I remember one summer I really got a very good tan and I thought, boy, now this is the epitome of sexiness. <laughs> remember I took a girl to the beach and as I disrobed and I guess I must have been strutting like a peacock and after about 10 minutes of this she looked at me and she says, how revolting. <laughs> how disgusting, you know. <laughs> And she, said, and she looked me straight behind. She says, you think I'm interested in you for your body? And I didn't know what else to say. You know, you've been working for six months on the ye old bod, and she doesn't pay attention to it. She says, look, I'm glad you're healthy, but, but I'm interested in, in you as a person. And, you know, it never dawned on me. It never dawned on me that, that a woman was more interested in me as a person than just as some kind of a physical creature. 
And I remember I felt very naked. And uh, in fact, I put my shirt back on. And... <laughs> but it's a devastating experience. And I, I think it's important that females understand this. It's a very trying time. And I think it's even worse today than when I was a kid. The tremendous need for, for fellows to have to prove themselves. But in the long run, their masculinity is enhanced, really, in a, in a much better way. In ways that really serve the purposes of love, not the purposes of vanity. And from a standpoint of a woman, to bring out her femininity. Now, as I say, I don't think a woman really is incapable of, say, opening doors for herself. Or doing a lot of things that... Uh, are nice to have men do for you, but it enhances a woman's femininity if she can be a lady. Now, I don't mean to say that a woman can't wash a car and a man can't help with dishes. I think that that's ridiculous that we get ourselves into such uh, pigeonholes that we can't cooperate in these things. It, this doesn't mean that a woman is going to lose her femininity if she even mows along. If a man changes diapers, he hasn't lost his masculinity. It's much deeper than that. I think that masculinity and femininity, though, are enhanced by really understanding and fulfilling the roles that God gave to us. That's really where masculinity and femininity de derives. So don't lose your womanhood by getting sucked into these cultural roles that say there are no differences between men and women. And if you can get your husband to open a door for you, sit still long enough so he can do it. Many men never open the door because their wives are out too soon. Mrs. White says that the early attentions ought to be continued. And you know, look at these early attentions and then look at your life now. What kind of a relationship do you have with your husband? Are these early attentions continued? Well, if not, you see, then something is being lost in the maleness and the femaleness of their relationship. So the first lesson that I want to draw from this depiction is that your own fulfillment is going to come through identifying with the role that God designed for you and not through some of these cultural obliterations that we see today in which a woman isn't supposed to be a woman, sort of a unisex type of thing. I think that's unfortunate. But secondly, there's another lesson to be derived. The worth that your partner has to you will depend upon your taking this role. Not only your own fulfillment, but the value that your partner has to you is to a great extent dependent upon you fulfilling your own role. When you stop investing your deepest self, you stop caring. Now, I can look at this from a male standpoint. Every time I extend myself to my wife to treat her in a special way, it might be just in noticing the way that she dresses. Some appreciation. Uh, some affection that I extend to her. Some thoughtfulness. It isn't that she's going to fall apart if she doesn't have this. But every time I do this, I establish her worth to me. That where, where the object of my investment will determine the value of whatever I invest in. And the reason so many men stop caring for their wives is they stop investing in them. And quite often, women make it very difficult for them to invest in them. And women stop investing their femininity. They try to be something else. But when you stop investing your deepest self, you stop caring to that degree. So not only is it essential in terms of your own fulfillment to take upon yourself and to identify with this role God gave you, but it is also necessary to establish the worth of the other person you relate to. Because when you really stop being yourself and stop investing yourself, to that degree you stop caring. And the last implication, which I think is what all of this points to, is that this is the way that God designed that we should become most deeply loving persons. And that's why God created us. Our deepest need 
is to get love. But it's interesting that God never told us to get it. He tells us to give it. There is a very good reason for this. When you become preoccupied with getting, you start keeping score with what's happening to you. What does that person mean when they say this? Why is some person getting more attention than me? And you start keeping score of what's happening to you. You can go in a crowd of people, and if you're preoccupied with getting love, with having other people care about you and watch about you, you might even become jealous of someone else's attention. And you stick out like a sore thumb and you're wondering, what's happened to me? You see, the focus is upon what comes in instead of what goes out. And, and pretty soon you become very insecure by this keeping psychological score of what's happening to you. And when you're focusing upon yourself, you're not really noticing anyone else. And you become a psychological sore thumb. And it can get so bad, you're defensive. And when someone maybe would become nice to you, you know, good morning to you, you might think, I wonder what they mean by that. You know, people can get so touchy because they see hooks in everything. That's what happens when a person turns within. When a person has to watch out for themselves, they become psychologically vulnerable. But when someone loves them, they are fulfilled and they don't have to watch out for themselves. But the preoccupation must never be with getting. God wants to develop a universe of givers, not getters. But look, if everyone is going to give, then no one has to worry. And of course, that's the kind of universe that God is ultimately going to build. But if everyone is concerned with getting, who's doing the love? Quite often when individuals become uh, overly or inordinately concerned with their getting love, I will ask the question, why should anyone love you? Now, it isn't that I say that they shouldn't, but you think, why should anyone love you? And the only good answer that you can give is that, well, I am lovable. I am the kind of person that, that would give love. That's the only guarantee that you will ever get, is that you are willing to give. But of course, in the Christian formulation, there is this realization that God does love us. In fact, our central worth really should derive from the fact that we are children of God, that God cares about us. And even when you don't like yourself, the realization that God cares about you should take precedence over the feelings that you have toward yourself. Okay, I maybe don't like myself at this particular moment, but God loves me, so I must be worthwhile unless I consider that God has terrible taste for loving me. But then you act upon that realization that someone cares about you. But to realize what you have to give, to realize this dependency, to realize this softness, to realize the, the qualities which you have to give, and then glory in the fact that this is your thing, is what really makes love possible. I remember when Barb and I were engaged and one of our mellower moods she said to me, and it would take a woman to come up with a statement like this, but that makes it nice. She says, you know, if, if I spend my time watching out after you and caring for you, you know, this, this kind of loyalty, that a woman can give, then you don't have to worry about yourself. And if you spend your time and your efforts and your concern caring about me, then I don't have to worry about myself. And if neither one of us has to worry about ourselves, we can focus on the other person. And that's really what love is all about. Well, what I'd like to emphasize this morning is that the capacities that God have given us, starting us out with the first couple, perfect, nothing wrong, no flaws, but incomplete, so that we could truly find our completion in the opposite sex, 
and thus demonstrate the highest quality of love. And it's really through the family, through these love relationships, that we are prepared for heaven. And all of us have some kind of identification with the family. Sin, of course, has distorted this. Our culture has distorted this. And we don't really reach the ideal on this ball of mud. But realizing what it is, and at least attempting to approximate us, will help us to find our own identity, our own fulfillment, and our own oneness.